Hey everyone, welcome to the show Off the Record. This is episode number 25 and I'm joined here today with Lee Gladish. Uh, Lee is the former co-founder at Reply.io and the current CEO at Airborne App, which is the industry's first sales engagement application purpose-built for agencies like like myself. Uh, he has been in the software uh, sales space for over 10 years and uh, we're really excited to have him on our, on our show today. Uh, after working with countless sales agencies, Lee has seen how, effect, how effective they can be and has picked up the tactics necessary to achieve massive results. He's also seen the challenges to help others build a better sales engine. So lots of knowledge I think uh, we're going to be getting out of Lee today. So awesome to have you. Join us today. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks for having me today. Cool. Cool. I'll, uh, the first question I have is um, uh, we were listening to some of the other podcasts you've done. And you mentioned something which I, I, I wanted to ask about, which was that you said that everyone has a Michael Scott moment in their career, but everyone needs to have a Dwight Schrute on their team. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, for sure. So I'm sure we've all watched The Office, the, the U.S. office. And, um, you know, we, you know, if you're a CEO, you know, let's say you're a manager, you're managing people. Um, Michael's a manager. And, uh, you know, there's certain things that he does that, you know, we all we all have like our Michael Scott moments that we we you know we don't want to associate with Michael. We don't want to pretend that we're, we're we're ever like Michael. But you know, like it's not like I roll out of bed and I burn my foot on the bacon because I want to burn. I want to make my bacon in the morning because I want to smell it. We're not like at that level. But there's always like management decisions that you make. And you're like, was that a Michael Scott moment? Did I did I do that? Like I hope I'm not that type of manager. Um, but more importantly, it's the Dwight Schrute, right? Dwight is his right hand man. He's that loyal employee. He's the he's the the guy or girl that's like there to like, you know, believe everything that you're you're building. You know, following you, helping you build that company, and that's really loyal and passionate. And and early on as a startup founder, if you can find that person to come on with that journey with you, you're going to be you know you all you need that person. You need that person that's going to be there with you, and. And, and helping you along that way. Um, and, and for most startup companies, it's, it's, you know, it's that first employee. Um, and that's okay if you're paying them, but if, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta find that passionate person really, really early on. It creates a great culture for the company, but you need that right hand man. And I know you've done this now a few times. You've, uh, you've co-founded a few, a few companies. Um, what do you look for in those, uh, traits? Like, how do you pick up on this now? Like, how do you, how do you find those Dwight Schrutes? Like, what do you look for in those people? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've, I've been pretty good at, you know, over the last few startups kind of finding finding that Dwight Schrute. Um, for me, you know, when you meet somebody, you almost know because, like, it's not – they're not asking about money. They're not asking about, like, are they going to be a manager or, like, what, what, what's the team going to look like when I run the team? Like, they don't even – it's like, what do you need today? And they just go do it. Right? They just come in and they just take care of it. They're going to handle prospecting. They're going to handle building a list. They're, they have like some connections of like, I know someone that's going to do this for, you know, help us on the budget or it's really cheap or I, I'm going to source a VA that I've worked with over the past three years. Like they come in and they just know how to optimize things right away. And they're not asking again. It's not about money. It's not about like, how much stock am I going to get? Am I going to get rich? It's not those things. It's like the very intangibles that that I really look for. Um, and then more importantly, it's like you take care of these, you take care of them, right? Like you 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 do whatever you can to get whatever they need. And um, yeah, so again, it's passion. You got to find that passion. Not a lot of people have it. Oh, for sure. Passion, grit, hustle, mm -hmm. eagerness <laughs> to yes. always learn something new. Yes. Um, let's talk about um, the importance of focus. Um, I think there is a lot of distractions these days, a lot of people, you know, maybe doing different things at the same time. And I know that you don't believe in, in doing anything part time. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your philosophy around that mindset? Yeah. So the reason why I don't believe in anything part time is because I've done it part time and it's never been a success. Now, Success means a lot of different things to different people. I've had, I can say, three or four part-time um, startups that I've done under the radar that, you know, 
sold for seven figures, but not a success. Um, good for the time that you put in. But if you really want to build a great business, you got to go all in, right? You have to go all in. Your focus, even investors, like you're not going to, like I, I do some angel investing. There's no way. First question I ask is like, are you doing this full time? And then it's like, well, we're still working our jobs and we're going to think about moving. I'm like, that's part time, right? Like it's good. You have to start that way. We all do, right? Yeah. So you have your part time job. You, you do the side hustle and then, but there's gotta be a time where it's like, you gotta go full time. Um, you gotta, you gotta take that break. You gotta, you know, get the max those credit cards out, raise a little money from friends and family. Like you're not trying hard enough. You gotta do that. Um, but it really comes down to focus. The focus is everything. You need to sleep, eat, breathe, be passionate, wake up in the morning and be like, you know, I'm, I have like eight meetings today and I hate, I wish I could do other things, but like, this is what's going to get me there. Um, and, and there's so many different pieces in the business moving. Like, how can you be doing anything part time? Like, I can't just imagine someone running a business saying like, yeah, I'm running a startup and I spend three hours a day doing this. I'm like three, like should be 14, 15. Yeah, I, I don't like, it's a great point you brought up because there's a lot of people I know that are working on a startup on the side or they're doing something. It's like three, four hours. And I'm like, what do you really get done in those three, four hours? Because I work 10 11 hours and I still can't get through all the shit I want to get through. And I'm like, I just realistically, like it doesn't make sense. And you know, on that note, I want to ask you, what do you think of the, what do you think of the whole Tim Ferriss six hour, six hour of work a week, a day, yeah, a week? Uh, yeah. Six, yeah. Um, I actually don't have, I, I have a lot of books here. I don't have that one here. It's at home. Um, sure. It's like, I think it's, I think it's great for a great title for marketing, right? <laughs> But if you can get it done in six hours, man, all the power to you. But if you're going to run a business in six, if you're running a, a, your, a side hustle, your own little business, you know, in on the beach somewhere and you're making great money, like awesome. Like that's success to you. That's awesome. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to downplay that. But if you're running a business, how am I going to work for six hours a week? And then I have like a team that's working 10 or 12. Exactly. It's just not like you just can't, you can't, you're never going to build a company that way. So you're set, you're starting, you're setting the groundwork and saying, Hey, we only work six hours a week, a day here, or we work six hours a week. That's it. We'll pay you full time. Good luck. I love, I love to get one of those jobs. Well, I know, me too. Full time, me too. full time pay for six hours a week. That's awesome. Like really, sign, my me, dream. Up. <laughs> yeah, sign dream. me up. Too. It's, everyone's, it's everyone's dream. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but you have to, going back to this, you have to, you have to start somewhere and starting part-time is great. And, and, and there's a lot of work that you can do on the part-time basis to, you know, build the framework of your, of your startup, talking to customers, getting feedback, like doing a lot of discovery with competitors, but then there's got to come that time where you gotta, you gotta move the needle. So in your opinion, and there is a lot of, I think people who are going to be listening to this content, you know, maybe first time founders that are maybe doing are in that position of that side hustle and they're, you know, indecisive whether or not they should make the move to doing it full time or, you know, totally jumping over. What would you say to them to be the main criteria to look at when they're making their decision on when they're ready? Is it revenue? Is it customers? Is it family, well, friends, easy, money? The easiest answer is that, you know, the business will give you the answer. Like you will know when you're booked with hundred meetings a, a month and leads are pouring in from the website and people are asking for your de for demos and, and buying your product and revenues going up. Like that's just an easy, de that's the easiest decision, right? Not a lot of us get to that point right away. It takes time. It always takes time. No one's going to get to that point, but the, the, the time to make that switch and that change, you know, you, there's outs there, there are outstanding factors. One is, you know, do you have a mortgage? Do you have kids like, where are you in your life? Like those mm -hmm. are things that you just, unfortunately, you can't make the, you can't make that risk, right? Not right. right away. So starting out that part time is is great, and then getting your setting yourself with some goals for saving some money, but setting yourself with some goals of like I make three thousand dollars a month, I can get by. That's that's what I need to do, and work part time until that point, and then make the move. But you have to set, you have to put the line in the sand, and figure out how much money I'm going to save 
how much money I need before I can move on board and go through the route of, you know, friends and family. Like, sorry, it's hard to, it's, sorry, it's tough to be a millionaire. Like it's, it's hard work. Sorry. Like you got to sacrifice if that's what you want to do, if that's what your goal is And money, but money's never been my goal. That's the thing. I've mm -hmm. never worried about like how much money I was going to make or I blindly went in and like, that's it. I'm in, let's, let's do it. I've saved some money. I'm fortunate and, and it's worked out, right? Because never, money's never been the motivator. So I think that's another thing too. If money's just your motivator, then there's a lot of other ways to easier ways to make money. Like you just sell an online course. Uh, regarding the family and friends um, funding, I want to ask you about that because a lot of people find it really difficult to go and get family and friends money. Um, and there's a lot of different options out there, and especially in Canada, like non-dilutive based type of um, funding options, the government or grants and things like that. Why, why, in your perspective, would you consider family and friends as, as a potential funding option? So I think as a founder, you have to get really comfortable pitching, asking for money. Like you don't need to raise money, but you got to get comfortable pitching and, and raising money and be confident in your own skin to believe in your product and what you're doing. And sometimes family thinks like, well, you know, John was a dropout and John never did, he never finished anything. Why am I going to give him a, yeah, okay. If you're that guy, maybe it's going to be a little bit harder for you. But if you've been a little, you know, at least have some accomplishments in your life, I think the family and friends, they're going to give you that good feedback. And if they have some money, you know, writing a, a, a thousand dollar check or a $5,000 check, it's going to get you a long way as a startup, mm -hmm. like a long way. So I think you have to get comfortable in your skin. You got to get comfortable pitching, got to get comfortable people saying no, because you're going to get a lot of that. And but and, but I think it's really good for you to work on the pitch, right? Like it's a great work, way to work on the pitch. The last thing you want to do is go and meet 20 VCs and you haven't refined that pitch because they all talk to each other and one passes, then the other one talks to the other and they all, the other one passes and the other one passes. And all of a sudden you've burned your, you know, your small network. Um, so friends and family is great to get a little bit of money, get some feedback. Hopefully there's that, that uncle that has run a business and give you some feedback there. Um, and it's going to get you thinking in a different way as well. So I think it's important, really just the pitch and getting in your own, comfortable in your own skin as a CEO. That's uh, that's really interesting. I, I Earlier on when I was doing my first uh, my first startup, I was kind of scared of going to my family to asking for money because like, you know, uh, it's tough asking for my parents, my grandparents, whoever it was, you know, to give me money because like, how do I know I could deliver? on what it is that I, I, I take from them or, you know, setting expectations or keeping things objective. Like what if they give me money and they're just giving me money just to support me, but they don't really believe in the idea. And then I'm basically on the wrong path. Right. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Like, how do you stay objective? I didn't, I didn't ask friends or like I asked friends, uh, but family, I didn't ask, I didn't ask for, cause I had enough friends that had money. So okay. it was, it was, it was <laughs> an easy, de it was an easy decision. It, I was, I was happy to have that, that opportunity. Um, my friends had money and they were like, sure, I'm happy to like 10, 10 K check. And some wrote some bigger checks. So that was great. They've always supported me, but we all support each other. I think that's, that's kind of how it's worked with us. Um, but family, no, I didn't, it didn't even, it didn't cross my mind. Right. Like I was just, it wasn't an opportunity, but, mm. um, Plus another thing too, my family doesn't, again, probably like a lot of other people, you know, immigrants to this country, they're like startup tech, like nine to get a nine to five. Where's the pension, right? Like it, where's the dividends? Is there dividends? Like, so a little bit different. Um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fly so much with me, but yeah, I went through the friends, but I think it's good. It's a good practice. If you feel comfortable then then do it. Um, but you know, go to your, go to your friends too. go to your ex boss, go to the last company you worked at. You know, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of a, a great way to even get comfortable pitching friends and family is there's a lot of community events that they do just like startup pitches or even just attend one and watch one. You don't have to pitch, just watch. Yeah. There's a lot of resources out there to get that information. And I think that's one thing that most startup founders don't do is that, you know, there's so much information out there. Everyone, I feel that wants the short answer, like they want the quick bullet magic it's going to happen and I'm going to be successful and everyone's using my product and they got to like, they got to work hard, but they don't want to ask the tough questions. Um, and I, I find that sometimes with, they don't want to put in the research and the work and, and understanding these things. They did, they, they, they want to, they, they, they want to hear what they want to hear. 
And um, I think that's I think that's one thing that a lot of you know early founders and I've been there too, right? Like I've been in the same position uh, as well. So I think you got to get out there and find a mentor, but go to these pitch events and just listen and, and watch and f- think that is it. Find out, figure out if it's out right for you. I think that's the first thing. When it comes to asking the tough questions, especially for founders, there's a few founders I've come across that we worked together with on projects that they never sometimes ask themselves, you know, very simple questions like, why am I building this product? Who is this for? Um, Some basic fundamentals. And I always kind of tie it to just having innovators dilemma, you know, among other things. What do you think this is? Is this tied to just having inexperience? They don't know what to optimize for in the short term, long term. Like, what do you think is the rationale? I, I, well, I, I feel that a lot of founders are probably scared of the answer. They don't want to hear the no, or, you know, they feel that they may have too much insight. And I think that's probably a problem too. When you have too much insight into things, like you're, you're so tunnel vision, um, you're not kind of seeing all the angles. So I, I feel that you need to make sure that you try to get as many people to look at your product, um, but not just look at your product. It's, am I going to the competitors? So like, what's the checklist look like? Uh, there's competitors in the space. Have I done the research? Have I gone to, have I done a demo with the competitor? Did I fill an online lead form? to see what that process looks like for that competitor. What are they doing that I'm not doing? What can I, what can I do that they're not doing? Um, look at the pitch they gave me. The, 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 the value prop on the website is completely different than the sales pitch that they gave me. Like you, you just see a whole bunch of different angles that you probably wouldn't have seen before. Um, so they don't want to hear the answers, right? They want to be like, oh, I, we do this so much better. What is so much better? And they don't, the big thing is they're scared. And this is the one of the biggest things I can I think anyone can walk away with if they're a startup founder listening to this today. If you can't go and prospect and ask your potential customers to talk to you about the product you're building, and if they can't give you time, they're not going to give you time when your product's ready. Or money. (laughs) Or money, right? So it's a great method of learning how to prospect. It's a great method of learning how to get in the door and start learning to sell because most founders, like some of them build really good products, but like they don't know how to market or sell. It's a really good experience for you to get into this really early and understand like, I'm building this product specifically for you. I can probably, you know, this is where we're thinking about how we can help. I'd love, you know, I, 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 you know, I'd love to show you what we're building and share our vision with you. And most, a lot of people are going to say yes, right? You're going to get a lot of people are going to say yes, 10, 20, 50, hundred people. No problem. I have no doubt. And that's a great experiment for you to understand what's happening. Um, and I think that a lot of founders are really scared to ask those questions and get on the phone because they're like, Oh, I'm I'm tech. I'm, I build things and I don't talk to them. It's a big problem. Very different. I see it all the time. Like I, I get sourced a lot of, a lot of deals to invest in and there's just small checks, but. I asked a lot of the founders, like I asked them all the same question. And a lot of the time it's like, yeah, we talked to one, one guy, we talked to one company. They really liked it. I was like, one, like you've been doing this for eight months. Like you've talked to one. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's great. It's amazing. I'm like, oh, come on. Like, yeah, put the time in. Right. What are some other, what are some, sorry, I'm going to ask this question, but what are some questions you ask? That's like, so, so how many people do you speak to? Sorry. Yeah, no, no, great. So the first thing is, are they doing it full time and part time? Like that's the full first thing I, I asked them. I asked them why, why they're doing this. What's the problem that they had? I want to, I want a founder to relate to the problem. Not like I worked at this, you know, fine. I worked at this company and I've seen our customers that, you know, there was this big need. Great. I love that. Right. They have insights. They have domain experience. I like that. Um, Oh, I, I want to build the product because I want to be a founder and you know, like I have a great developer. He's the best developer I've ever seen. Not an not a great answer I want, right? I want them so I ask questions around why, full time, part time. I want to know how long they've been working on this. I want to know how the founders know each other. I want to know if there's a technical founder. I always want a technical founder. Not like and and a lot of founders recently that I've been coming across have been like, no, no, we have no technical founder here. We have an offshore team. I don't, that makes me scared. 
right? You're building a tech company and you're not building the tech on your own. Um, eventually you got to like, that's great to get off, off the start, but what happens after you're like, there's a, there's a kind of a, a cross section that you have to figure out. So that's what I usually like to, to figure out first. And then, you know, you, you know, when you really meet a really good founder, right? They just articulate their product really well and the problem really easily. If I can't understand it, then I'm like, no, thanks. Uh, it's, it's so true about the part about the technical founder. And I recently interviewed, um, Rachel uh, from the Entrepreneur Fund, and she said that at the Entrepreneurs Fund, they always recommend, um, they don't believe in the three-person co-founder approach, they believe in the two-one, and that one of them has to be has to be a technical co-founder. Otherwise, like, it just the dynamic doesn't work there. And I, I agree with that 100%, mm -hmm. even when we speak to pr prospects or clients, and they're like, yeah, you know, I'm the founder, I, I you know, I wanna build this product, I'm like, cool, will help you build the MVP, but you need to have a CTO. Yes. From that point forward, once the product's ready and it's out, you know, you need to have somebody there on your side internally because investors are going to look for these type of things. So great points, great points. Um, I want to, uh, going back to the whole focus part, um, you, you know, I find that entrepreneurs sometimes have a hard time uh, being focused or having a specific niche that they're doubling down on sometimes a bit scattered and, you know, quite general, but of the problems they want to solve, it doesn't have like a MV MVP approach or like a minimal viable job it's supposed to do. What as a founder, what do you need to look out for to make sure that your niche is not too narrow at the same time? So an easy exercise is, you know, doing some, you know, not just market research, but market sizing. So picking the market, the, the, the ideal client that you want to sell to. So for us, let's use our scenario. For example, we sell to, um, a smaller part of our niche is sales agencies. So we went and looked on, you know, clutch and Fiverr and a whole bunch of other places on LinkedIn. And we're like, okay, there's at least, you know, 10,000 of these agencies out there, uh, if not more that we could, that we couldn't find. And then we looked at the marketing agencies and we're like, you know, a lot of marketing companies are using, you know, still traditional marketing software for, you know, very like te plain text email sales type emails, which, you know, they can, but really not built for that. So we're like, okay, you know, our, our market niche is big enough. And then if we sell a license at $60 a license or a hundred dollars a license at even if it's like 5,000 licenses, you're like, okay, this is, you know, like a, a five, 10 million ARR business in the next few years. But that doesn't mean you can't expand, right? You're going to land and expand and like go into different markets and verticals. Cause what a one, the first year and two years looks very much different than year four and five and very much different from year nine and 10, like very much different. So when I'm looking at it, I definitely want to do that marking market sizing experience experiment where I take a, how much I, I think I'm going to sell my product for how many clients I think that are out there. And, and actually find where they are. And it's a simple, you know, it's a simple math, you know, just simple math. You just get added up and you can kind of see where you are. If you only, if you're having a hard time trying to find prospects and you go on LinkedIn, you run a search and you're like, Oh, there's none here. And this is, this is a problem. Then you're going to know that you're probably in the, in, in, in the wrong, in the wrong market. Another one is competitors. You want to look at how many competitors in the space? Another thing I look for founders, there's no competitors do what we do. We couldn't find one. I'm like, there's probably a reason why, right? So like, maybe it's just like an adjacent market or vertical. Like, so let, maybe they're not explaining it well, but that's a, that's a red flag for me. But I definitely want to uh, look at the, the competitors, look at the market. I want to look at their site traffic. I want to see who's coming to the site. I want to see, you know, what type of customers are selling to. Are they enterprise? I also want to look at the market and see, this is a really good practice. You look at the market and you see client, uh, the, the bigger customers that just keep raising more money and keep going more up market. Cause when that happens, you find that the bottom of the market just like really opens up. I found that at my last startup that, that happened, like we weren't doing anything special and it was like, wow, we're just getting a lot of people coming over because the bigger competitors were like, sorry, we can't sell to you anymore. And they came to us. Hmm. So that's a, that's an insight that, you know, you, you'll find out later. So those are the things that I like looking for. Um, and you know, you got to feel comfortable knowing that 
you know, what's the 10x reason of why this company is going to use your product over what's already out there? That's a big, big why, right? You got to figure out that what that is. Yeah, uh, for sure. That's that's the, the exact question that I think will define the success of your company. You know, what is that specific reason people would use your product over something else? Um, I know this is something that you strongly believe in because you mentioned it before. But you mentioned um, founders must close a set amount of revenue. You know, first I want to ask why? Why do you think that? Yeah, I'm a big believer in this. Um, so as a founder, my okay. So the fir- the easiest is how do you expect to hire people and just bring someone on board from day one and expect that person to close and you've never closed the deal? Like, there's no knowledge transfer. There's none of that, right? Like that, I think that is just so weak. Like just call bullshit on that right away. That's like, we have this great sales guy. He's amazing. And I, I closed the first deal. So like he or she knows like the whole process now. It's not about the sales process. It's about like the feedback and the customers. But here's the bigger one. Your first 10, 20, 50 customers, they're buying you. Like they're buying the founder. You got to like... They want to. They want to know your mission. They want to know your vision. Your like your values. Like why you're building this company. Why are you even? Why do you even exist? Why are they going to come on this road with you? Like there's all of that. So like what happens if like okay early products? There's going to be an issue. There's going to be a bug. It's still early, and then they're going to go to the sales guy, and the sales guy's going to be like, oh sorry, okay, well hold on, let me go to my dev and I'll see what's going on. No, like they want to call the founder and they're going to be like, hey. Like, what's going on here? Okay, like, this is, the, here's the real reason. Here's, like, you build that rapport with them. You build that trust. Like, it's so important for early on. Early on. You build those advocates. Like, it's really important. More than, I, the, more than the sales process side. I couldn't agree more. When I, anybody who I speak to, when we speak to clients or even any of the venture stuff that we do, it's always like, is the founder selling? And are they the main reason why that company is successful? Because... It, it always becomes apparent whether or not that company can succeed, but also that founder has to then transfer that knowledge to a team, right, for it to scale. As a founder, though, what, what would you say should be that threshold in terms of the amount of revenue you should close or, you know, bring in yourself? Yeah, so the deal sizes matter. Like if you're, a, you know, let's say you're selling, you know, a $50 license, and you close, you know, like you're up to like 15, 20 K MMR, maybe 25. And they're like, okay, I have time for a salesperson now. I think you should still co-sell. I still think you should still be closing at least for a few, first few hundred thousand. If you're selling bigger deals, I think probably even more so, you're gonna probably have to need to be closing deals. Um, but there has to be a transition. I talked to a lot of founders, friends, and they're like, yeah, you know, I'm still, you know, I'm still selling. I'm still managing the sales team. I'm like, you're three, four, five million ARR. Like, what are you doing here? Like, you know, what's going on? And then there's founders that have no VPs of sales. And that just makes, I just laugh at that. I'm like, you have no VP of sales? Like, who's running the ship here? So there's, there's, there's a lot of mistakes there. But yeah, definitely for the first, you know, if you're selling a small little ticket item, $50, you definitely want to make sure that, you, you know, 20, 30, 40 K MMR, probably at least co-sell to that point. And I think you should always still be really involved for, for a little bit, a little bit of time until you have three or four salespeople in, in a, in a, in a VP of sales. Um, so I think it's, I think it's important you, as a co-founder, as a, as a CEO co-founder, you have to be always really tied close to the customer. I, yeah. I'm a firm believer in that. Yeah. Keep your, uh, your ear to the ground close to get feedback and thoughts on how to improve the product. I totally agree. I, yeah. I'm a huge believer in having the founders um, be the first salesperson until it gets to that point, uh, 30, 40 K MRR. Um, for sure. Uh, good point. Yeah. Um, the next question I have is an uh, interesting one because I have my own opinion on it. Uh, okay. Uh, it, it, you, I know you're not a fan of Reed, Hoff's, Reed Hoffman's. Um, if you're not embarrassed by your first product, you launch too late. Yeah. Uh, why, f- from your point of view, why do you, why do you disagree with that? Yeah. So 
Yeah. So just so we were clear, I, I definitely don't have a problem with Reed Hoffman. Just to, <laughs> just that quote. Um, I actually have his I have his book right here. Um, so I'll give you a perfect example. Um, superhuman. We all know Superhuman, right? Right. Phenomenal yep. product. Beautiful UI. Probably the one product I used first that came out of the gate. Like brand new, you just you signed up, you used it, and you're like, wow, like what a what an experience! It like it it looked like it probably was probably bug free. It, it was perfect. There's a perfect example, right? Like you think that you're going to launch a product in email. There's probably a 50 email clients already, and 50 500 that probably already failed, and you're going to launch a product that's half baked, and people are going to be like, thanks, no thanks. My product that we built. There's competitors. If you're building a market with competitors, there's a baseline that they expect. Like there is a fundamental experience that they need, core features that they need to have. And if you launch a product that's like, hey, this is kind of what we're thinking of doing. It's not ready yet. People are like, yeah, great. This is cool. Like, let me know when you're finished. They're not going to run their business on it, right? But if you're building a product that is very new entrant into a market um, and maybe you don't have a lot of competitors or the competitors are really, really weak and you have like that one feature that's like so good, but the other stuff is really weak, I think that's the only way you can get away with it. But I don't believe nowadays how quick and fast you can go build product and find teams that you should go out and be like embarrassed about this product. Like I built a full baked product that had so many features and clients were still like, Oh, do you have this one thing that we really need? It's like, Oh no, not yet. And it's, it's hard still, right? It's still hard. So yeah, I don't, I'm definitely don't take, I don't take the, to that adage at all. Would you say that there's a difference though in that, in that mindset between B2B businesses versus B2C? Yeah, I'm not a B2C. I'm, I'm definitely not a B2C guy. Um, you, although I had like, you know, sold like online supplements, you know, just make, you know, easy money before it was really <laughs> simple to do like seven, eight years ago. Um, but I'm not a B2C person, but I think it probably, it is a little, it is a little bit different. Um, B2B, there's so many, like I, I would be hard pressed to find how many competitor, how many companies are coming out that don't have any competitors or adjacent competitors. So you, I think you have to build like a pretty good product, but B2C is probably a, a different use case for sure. So my my counter to that thought process yes, is I was going to ask, and I've been down this rabbit hole many many a time. Is um, your product can never be perfect at the end of the day, right? And I know you only have one shot to wow people or impress people and to have that stickiness for them to come back because if something's broken, they're going to just delete the app and then sign out, right? Mm -hmm. But it's always a fine balance understanding when is something shippable enough uh, because you need to get something out. You can't just be constantly building years and years, m hundreds, millions of dollars. Like I've seen this happen and then you ship it and it still falls flat on its face. Right. Yeah. So like, yeah. how, how do you balance that though? Because like you can't be building a product until it's perfect forever. Yeah. I think you have to really define requirements and this is always hard even though we've done this a few times, we still made a mistake this time around a little bit. Like there was a few things we could have done better. Um, but you have to have the core, like this is our core. This is our, this is what we're going to release. Even though we pushed that out a couple times or like a month, month, month and added a few extra things in there, but you have to have your core and you have to set your line. So that's, that's my answer. You have your core. Here's a defined requirements. We hit this word we're releasing. And even if it's just like, here's five or 10 people that you know that are like early, could be those early adopters for you. You got to got to get it out to them, right? They're not going to maybe run their business on it in day one, but like they can run some tests for you. Um, and that's another thing is that your testing doesn't matter. Like you got to test it, but the pro the customers, their their tests and workflows are completely different than yours. Everyone, you wouldn't believe how many edge cases you're going to run across, right? Mm -hmm. And you will. So I think you got to get it out. But as far as like you know, embarrassed about the product. No, I, I think you have to be like pretty confident about like, this is a, this is a really good product and it's very comparable to some of the other things that other com you know, com companies have. Okay. So yeah. my, my next question is more of a product strategy question then mm -hmm. is how can you walk away 
from requirements that you know you know or we know to be true to produce to pursue something that we think will help yeah, so at any given time, you can only really work on, you know, five, 10% of your product, 5% of your product at any given time. And there's a lot of things you're going to have to walk away from. So how we look at it and how I would give advice on this would be, are you building for growth? Like, is it, what's the growth lever for that product, that the features that you're building? So um, I want to build A, my, my developer, my CTO wants to build B, we talk and we're like, What's the growth lever for this? And then what are the dependencies on this one product? If I build a phone dialer, I know it's just a phone dialer. It's just going to dial and it's going to make a phone call. But if I build a core feature that maybe take an extra month or so longer, but it's going to give me more growth and I can build three or more products on top of that that make that product phenomenal in a year or two from now, I'll probably build that. And I also look at the core. Is it core to the product? So the, what I walk away from is if it's, if it's not a um, core to the product and I look at, I look at growth as well. And more importantly, like, do I want it or do my clients want it? Or like how many people are asking for it? I think that's, that's a, that's a whole other conversation. You know, the, the best advice are people who never give you money and like, you got to watch out who those are. Like those free users are like, oh, yeah. the, they'll complain and they're like, Oh, I'm a free user. I need this feature. I won't buy your product. I'm like, well, you're not giving me money yet. I'm, you know, I'm sorry. Like I, I just, you have to set a line. I've done this so many times now. If I'm getting advice, unsolicited advice from free users, then uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to take, you got to watch who you're getting advice from as well with, as far as product feedback. So I think that goes down to have you talk to 50, 60, 70 potential prospects as far as like really understanding. And then you got to decide what you want to build. I don't think like the biggest mistake, and, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this. I, I, I talked to, again, a lot of other founders and they're like, oh, we get all our product feedback from our customers. I think that's complete bullshit. I'm sorry. Like, I don't know. A lot of people are like, oh, our customers build our roadmap. I'm like, really? Are you saying that to make them happy? Or because like you want to be that type of company? Because I don't believe that in it at all. Like, I think you have to have a vision and your mission and, you know, like you what take take the feedback that you have from all these other customers and try to make the best decisions for them. But I don't believe that you should just listen to your customers and be like, we did a poll and over overwhelming. I did that. I made that mistake and I built features and they're all, they're all mistakes because we're like, Oh, those were the customers want. How do you really know? Like you don't know the situation. You just taking a poll. So love to hear your feedback on that. Yeah. I think it's a fine balance. Like, uh, there's obviously top down ideas that can be pushed into a product that you are a subject matter around, or you know, what's going to work. And then there's the bottom up approach where you're getting feedback from the, from the actual users. The, the thing I always would say is like, okay, um, can you get buy-in financially from all these people in order to sustain building out their needs? Because at the end of the day, you are, you, you know, as you said, I'm, I really believe in that is that a lot of free people who aren't paying for your products are like the worst people to ever talk to, to get product direction on, because you're just basically going to be spending your time and money buildings for something that they're never going to pay for because it'll be something else. The exactly. moment you start, the moment you start putting tangibles around it, around saying, okay, cool. I, I think this will be a cool feature for us to build. There's a couple other people we're looking for, you know, would you pay for this? Especially in the enterprise space, it could be a custom feature. Like that's what I love yeah. about enterprise software B2B is that all those custom requests are all things that you could build for, bill for. <laughs> to you know help align with your product if it makes sense but at the end of the day you got to run a business and you got to make sure that people are paying for what it's worth but i do agree with what you're saying i think at the end of the day you have to know what you think is best for your product because you're the one who's living breathing every day and it's it's important to have that visibility from the client side but also like you need to make some decisions and so one thing I always like to tell founders is when you go and you come up with a proof of concept or you get, you know, some people excited about it, say, Hey, you know, I, I can't do this for free. Will you pay me something financially ahead of time up front yes. in order for me to see the viability of building this into an actual business, just transparently. 
And if they say, no, uh, you know, I'm not going to pay you money, then you don't have a business. If people say yeah. to you, yeah, I'll give you a thousand bucks and then cool. Then I'll be like, okay, cool. I'll build it. And then you'll have six months off of the product once it launches. And then you start paying after the six month. Then you know you have something because somebody's giving you money for nothing. Of course. All right. I agree. Um, on that note, though, um, there's a lot of distractions as a founder when you're building a, a company or building a product. And you, I think you, you mentioned this before about the importance of being patient and staying in your lane. Um, mm -hmm. Companies, like from a lot of the recordings I've been doing, people say that as a founder, it takes really, on average, about 10 years to go from start to end to exit. That's oh, what yeah. I've been hearing a lot. How do you how do you stay focused and constantly remind yourself, okay, I'm in this for the long run, 10 years, this is a stretch, it's a commitment. Because from a lot of people that I spoke to, after they do this once, they do not want to do it again. <laughs> oh, I should talk. I, yeah, I don't know those. I don't. I, I don't know a lot of those people. But um, our circle, my circle of friends, are like, yeah, they're serial entrepreneurs. So I, I like to look at it, break it down, I, and and again, from my experience, the longest that I've been at a company is five years. Right? It's been five years. I haven't been, you know, built a company in five to ten years. Five was the longest. Um, but the way I look at it is you know you break it down you know year by year right you know year one is going to be tough year two is going to be a little bit better if you're last if you last that long okay and then right around you know you know year two you're in your second year you're going to get some help you know you're going to have some people around you and i think that's you know what year three and four looks like it's like you're not doing it alone anymore or you shouldn't be alone alone you got good people around you and you can again be a lot even more a lot more focused once you start bringing those people on so i break it down by you know one year at a time and i definitely think it's definitely a five to ten year unless you want to sell earlier if you have a good good offer but it's definitely five to ten years um but how i kind of go every day in some long really long days is that i know that this is not going to be forever right by myself right now i have a team but you know on the sales side and you know i have great support but eventually the like the cavalry will be coming and uh, it's ex it's exciting. So and then things start changing. Revenue solves everything. Couldn't agree more. Right? If you have Revenue money, solves <laughs> all you know the <laughs> pain and the long hours and every and the customers coming and you like they're paying for it and they're happy. That solves everything. And that really keeps you going, right? I think when you when you really look at like you've been doing this for three or four years and you're just kind of by yourself, like I couldn't do that. I like go to I go get a job probably like I don't know. Um, I don't even know how to interview for a job, but um, <laughs> I'd be a nightmare working for somebody. Never mind, like if I had to go for a job interview. But uh, that's a side note. Um, I'd be like, founder, what are you doing? Like you're the CEO. Like get going here. What's what's happening? Why are you sitting down? Go talk to the team. Like it, it'd be like one founder to another. I think it'd be a nightmare. But um, yeah, so I, I, I that's that's what I feel like. You have to um, you have to you know break it down. You need those wins, right? Those wins are going to carry you. Um, on a side note, though, I really, I was, I was actually saying this the other day. I was like, I've never been more tired in my life, and it's not because I'm running a business. I like, I, I, it's because of COVID, right? Like, stuck inside. Even though I'm at an office here, I'm just down the street from my house, and this place is pretty much like there's nobody here really. So like, that's the only reason why I come. But there's like no vacation, no golf, no travel, no like any. It's the same thing. It's a groundhog day every day. It becomes it's it been a little bit harder than I've than I've used to so need a little break you need to get out meet the, you know even with the team and be together those things are really important as you build the company so I find now with COVID it's been a little bit tougher uh, for sure even I think uh, I just read this other day uh, the CEO of Zoom said publicly that he even has Zoom fatigue himself yeah so like I think everybody's just so tired of this right now and we are it's feels like a never-ending story one we'll day, see. I think we'll, it'll get better. One day, one day, so hopefully soon. Um, wanna, <clears throat> last couple of questions, uh, Lee. I wanted to ask about um, co-founder dynamics, and like you know, I've had my own share of problems, nightmares, to be honest. You know, over the last eight years, in, you know, different companies and stuff like that. It's always tough working with co-founders. You you go in, you know, there's certain thoughts around going into like. A marriage which is what it is essentially I, I know you've had your fair share um mm -hmm. and i know you've had some 
uh, issues like where you had to let one go if i'm not mistaken yeah. you know what what was your story like is it is it okay to ask yeah for sure i'm i'm happy to talk about it and i think it's good for for everybody to to kind of understand and they don't run through the same thing so much like a co-founder like you said like a relationship you need to make sure from day one and we did this at airborne when we started you know what our mission what's our vision you know what are our values right like we kind of define that and they're they're always moving right we're moving them a little bit but you know we define like let's sit down let's talk about mission vision and values and what we stand for and what we want to do and integrity and all these other things um i but i did that here my last company you know, we tried to start implementing that at the end, but it was a little bit too late. Okay. So for my last company, just the easiest way to put it was my co-founder and I broke up um, because our mission and vision and values, everything was just not aligned at all. How we want to build the products, how we want to just how we manage people, how we manage our time, how we manage our vacation, how we work, how many hours we put in, like, we just weren't aligned with everything. Everything was just off. And it's okay, right? Like, it just wasn't, it wasn't right. And after I left my last company, when I started Airborne, I wanted to make sure that, first of all, everybody was in full time. Like we were going to sacrifice. We were going to quit our jobs. We were going to leave. We were going to do whatever we needed to do. We were going to put in the same amount of money. Like this is what we were going to do. And because it becomes pro like, hey, I'm going to put an extra hundred grand than you are. Well, guess what? I want an extra 15 percent. Like those are tough conversations. Mm -hmm. So. I'll leave that for, for your for founders to figure it out on their own. But, you, you know, we, so we made sure, like, from day one, this is what we wanted. And then, so at Airborne now, we started with three co-founders and, and good friends, right? Like, both my co-founders, good friends. Um, we we definitely talked, you know, you know, a year well before we even started Airborne, just talking about building other things. We actually had another horrible idea that we, that we didn't do. But anyways... Um, I'll talk that at the end. I'll tell you what we we're going to do. I, it was a horrible idea. And um, so we were going to think of doing something. And then I left my last company. And then we were like, hey, let's maybe let's go build Airborne. So within about six months into Airborne, one of my co-founders, um, he was really down. It wasn't part, it wasn't full time. My Me and my other co-founder, my CTO and I were putting in full time hours. We were fully dedicated. This is all we were doing. And my other co-founder had his side gig and we were like that's cool because like it was it was good for our business it was okay and i wasn't gonna ask him to leave that but it was just a side thing um and i should have realized i'm like you know what it's not full-time still like full-time is full-time and only this and um he was really passionate about what he was doing and it was a good break though like there was no like you're out of here and see you later and you're, you're done it was just like it was an easy conversation because he wanted it we wanted it and it was just good for everybody. So we're so good friends and like everything, it worked out really good. Um, but it, it, the, but the decision early on, if I didn't have my previous experience, I would have been like, ah, it'll be okay, we'll, we'll figure it out. No, there's no figuring out. It's like you're, you're in or out and that's, that's, that's what happened. So, um, so for me looking for a co-founder, like I want someone who's so passionate about, they wanna build this business, sleep, eat and breathe this business. All they think about is this business you know, they're, they're able to support me. And it's about the strengths. Like if you start a company with three co-founders or two co-founders and you're both marketing pros, but you're building a technical product, I'm like, you probably don't, you maybe need a third or maybe just one, do it, find someone else to do it with you. So you got, it's that matchmaking, like I'm sales and marketing and my co-founder's technical and, and he's great on product. So it's like, we got it covered. Yeah, that's the good feedback. I, I love, I love what you said about making sure there's alignment and core core purposes mission mission vision beliefs values and things like that mm -hmm. um it's interesting and we to... instill it to the team too like when we do our town hall like and that's another thing that we do like we do what we feel that just because we're a startup that you know we should have a town hall we should have like a weekly and a monthly meeting we should be transparent with the team and what we tell them and, and what we're doing and what we're building um and you know my other companies are really like wasn't so much there. And I'm like, that's not happening this time around. Like if I truly want to build a great company, got to have, have great people. They got to be with me and they got to know that they're here. We're, we're in it together. It's not like a, a job for them. And that's what we want. Like that's what we, that's what we're looking for. And, and actually like one of the recent developers that we hired, 
you know, he saw a posting and he's like, Hey, I'm actually like an intern and I'm out of school. Like I'll work for free. And we're like, no, we'll pay you. Like, let's just interview you. He was so passionate and he was, um, he's amazing. So those are the kind of people we want. Those are, those are the gems. Yeah. You got, you got, you got lucky. Okay, last yeah, question. Last question, Lee. Uh, what would you say to your 30 year old self? I always like asking this question. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, early forties, um, 30 still, I was still in like startups, but I would say more like a, my 22 or 25 year old self, like right out of school, 23 year old self, you know, I, I wish I would have learned programming. I wish I would have programmed. Yeah. I, I think that I could have, you know, built some great things and, and tested things on my own. Um, yeah, I would have learned to program and start, start a startup. It doesn't matter what it is. It fails, it burns, it crashes. Just go like get in hustle somewhere, some, something somewhere something i love it no that's yeah. true i think having even basic knowledge of programming these days is a must i think yes everything is moving towards that direction and i i tell everybody like get get your basics understand what's what at, at a minimum i have my nine-year-old daughter programming already oh really wow that's good yeah. that's great yeah. she's, she's yeah. on the right yeah. track mm -hmm. um awesome lee that was amazing thank you so much for your time thanks for participating on our show yeah, thanks, Ram. I appreciate it. Um, anytime. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, thank you. Yeah. And uh, thank you, everyone who's going to be listening. This was another off the record podcast. Um, it's a new podcast with the goal to build a community of founders and VCs to help each other build better to build uh, to build better businesses together. Thanks again. And I'll see you next time.